Greetings, my name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. Now, when many new Dungeon Masters are starting out for the very first time, one of the common things that they often do is put a ton of work into planning their very first campaign, going way overboard planning the adventure, the setting, the world, all the details and encounters right up front at the beginning, thinking they have to do this mountain of work before they even start. And while doing that much work can be a little bit of a mistake, it's not the biggest mistake that a new DM can make. The biggest mistake happens when a new DM invites people to play with them. There's a lot to discuss today, so let's get rolling. The second biggest mistake that a DM can make, though, is not backing our current Kickstarter. Our latest Kickstarter project, Monsters of Drakenheim, is heading into its final few days on Kickstarter, and we are so excited to share this eldritch tome of 150 new monsters inspired by dark fantasy and cosmic horror with every DM. Whether you're a veteran or a new DM, you're going to find some amazing monsters designed by yours truly for you to use in your campaigns, whether or not you're running your own homebrew world or our classic Dungeons & Dragons adventure. We've been playtesting several of the monsters in an actual play campaign that you can check out right up over there, and the results have been really, really fun. These monsters perform really well in combat and also are a lot of fun for the players to engage with. We think that this book is going to be jam-packed with a lot of awesome new monsters. Obviously, we're a little biased on that. But the monsters are also bringing to the table new deadly conditions, as well as new rules for epic bosses, which are a way to make your boss monsters a one-on-one -on -one solo encounter against your group of players. No matter the size of your party, they can be a threat. Best of all, all the monsters in our book are chock full with adventure hooks, loot, role-playing traits, and combat tactics. So if you are a new dungeon master, you've got all the guidance that you need to use these monsters at the table in an engaging and exciting way. You can back the Kickstarter right now by following the links down in the description below. Now let's talk about the mistakes that a new DM can make. The biggest mistake. The situation. You're a brand new DM looking for players, and we hear this a lot at first, you don't know where to find players, but one thing that Monty and I have noticed is that once you start finding players, they start coming out of the woodwork. It's really common whether you post online or just start sharing with your friends and coworkers that you want to run D&D, &D, that every new player comes with another friend that they want to invite to the group. And next thing you know, you might have six, seven, eight, nine, ten players that all want to play D&D with you and are really excited to join the game. Maybe you've been watching Critical Role and you see eight-person groups and think to yourself, hey, that's normal. If Mercer can do it, so can I. And that's where the problem comes in for a new DM. Managing the social experience and the gameplay experience for six to eight people is actually really overwhelming for a new DM. When people are brand new to D&D, &D, this includes the DM and the players, and they haven't grasped the rules fully and haven't found the social dynamic of the table, there's a lot of elements at play during the first few sessions of a brand new D&D &D group that are somewhat nebulous. And the larger the group is that you have at the table, the more pronounced this problem becomes and the harder it is to manage. It gets even worse if you're playing online. If you've ever been in a Zoom call with 10 people, you know how bad it can be. Or if you've ever been in a voice chat with a whole bunch of people all trying to t talk at the same time, you know, just that dynamic alone makes everything more complex. Now add on top of that, not only do you have six, seven, eight people all sitting around a table trying to focus on one thing at a time, but now you're all also trying to possibly learn the new rules of the game, and everyone is trying to have this back and forth that occurs. Because the biggest thing with D&D &D that a lot of people don't realize is that there's this thing that is the spotlight that is happening. And the spotlight is always on one person at a time because D&D &D is a oral or vocal medium. We use our descriptions and our words to say what our characters are doing. And so by necessity, only one person can be speaking at a time. 
There's an analogy that we've used before that I actually really like, where if you order a large pizza, and that represents the spotlight and how much time people get the spotlight. If there are three people sharing a large pizza, everybody gets enough to eat. If there are 10 people sharing a large pizza, the amount of pizza that each person actually gets is far less. And there might be people who are left out and somebody ate three slices while somebody else gets none. I mean, that's poor party planning, in my opinion. But the spotlight at the table is shared amongst all the people. And really, if your game session's always going to be three or four hours long, then the larger the group, the less pizza there is to share. This can be even worse if you've got people who don't know each other before, and some people want to order a vegetarian pizza, and some people want to meet lovers, some people hate pineapple on their pizza, and other people love pineapple on their pizza, some people want extra cheese, some people want thin crust versus thick crust, some people want to try that fancy new sauce, and other people just want the, 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 the standard sauce, some people want the pizza to arrive 40 minutes from now, some people really just want to eat right now. Scheduling alone with a bigger group. Exponentially more difficult to, to manage. Getting everybody in, in the same room, whether virtually or in person, at the same time. And if you do have that one person at the table who is taking three slices of pizza, leaving a few other players to have none, that's going to be more difficult to manage. There are problem players out there, and problem players might not realize they're problem players. They might be spotlight hogs. They might be min-maxers uh, in, in the negative way. There are also min-maxers in the positive way. But if you're at a table where new players who don't quite grasp the rules of the game are playing at the same table as a spotlight hog min-maxer, that could cause an imbalance and a problem at your table. It's also way easier when, especially when you've got that problem player that's hogging the spotlight for the other people at the table, particularly those that might be seated further away from you physically as, as the dungeon master, they become more distracted and disengaged and tune out. People start pulling out their phones because, of course, in combat, there's eight people sitting around the table. And so after you take your turn, it's going to take 20 minutes for it to come back to your turn again. And now the player's been on their phone the entire time. And they're like, oh, yeah, what was happening? And you can't really, I don't really blame people for zoning out when it, they have to wait around for 20 minutes to get back to their turn. And this is the compound effect of everything slowing yeah. down when you have more people. It just, the mere fact of the matter is it's harder for that spotlight to swing around from person to person to person when you have that many people, whether it's role playing exploration, teamwork, or decision-making, everything slows, especially decision-making, all of the demand. <laughs> and when you are making decisions or, or engaging in the other pillars of play, the social dynamics, the exploration, all of those, it becomes even more difficult if you have some players who are a little more shy. In a smaller group, the shy players can be pointed out and asked what their opinion is. Obviously not put on the spot if they're too shy, they may not feel comfortable role-playing, but even as a DM saying, oh, player number three out of my four-player table hasn't spoken in a while, I can simply say, hey, what do you think of what the guard said? Do you have any input? And they can be like, no, or they can say, yeah, actually, I was going to ask them this, which is, which is an awesome thing to do. But once you get into a group of eight or more players, it really starts to become hard to even notice who hasn't spoken up in a while. There might be two or three players who are doing most of the decision making. Some players might be okay with that. Some players might leave the table feeling like they didn't really get a chance to, to engage in the game. And so while well, the scheduling problem is awful, the managing all the problem players can be really challenging and even just finding the balance for role playing that is to say nothing about how much harder it is to balance combat for groups that are larger than four in fact once you get into the six to eight player range it starts to become an exponential problem to balance combat because challenge rating and the whole assumptions of the math of the game are based around a group of four characters. And the action economy in 5th edition D&D scales in a wonky way as the group gets larger. Here's the problem. As the group gets larger, you have to use more enemies to keep things challenging. But adding more enemies to an already larger group means that now the monsters have more turns 
in between the eight players that are already taking 20 to 30 minutes to get around the table. Now it's taking an hour for each round of combat. The other option that you have is to use a monster that is challenging enough to threaten and stand up to all the players. But then, if you are making it powerful enough to do that, it might one-shot a player character who is a little bit squishier than the others. No matter what, you're causing problems at the table, and this can slow things down an incredible amount. If you're using a monster and it's it's a lich with 10 zombie ogres and a swarm of zombies and archers and another spellcaster apprentice, uh, that with your eight players is going to take hours and hours. I've heard of people doing a single combat encounter that lasted multiple sessions and everybody felt exhausted. Yeah. There's no secret that the most exhausting and draining part of D&D is combat encounters. They're sometimes the most fun, but if you're doing it for hours and hours and hours, it can get a little exhausting. Yeah. In my experience, groups with six to eight players struggle to do more than one combat encounter, even in a three to four hour game session, whereas a group of three or four characters can breeze through the combats because they are more brisk and fast with everybody's turns and you're using less monsters. There's less for you to manage. Like the mental load of the eight person party on a DM of like tracking all the conditions, all the abilities, all the monsters, everything. You can mitigate these things by having another player be the one to help you track initiative and hit points and things like that. You often need to do that with big groups. But really and truly, all of these things are mitigation strategies. The fact of the matter is, is that it is harder to run combat with a large group flat out. There's things that you can do to make it easier to make it better, but it's always going to be tougher. So our advice for brand new DMs out there, or even ones that are maybe finding themselves over encumbered by the play group that they have, is to form a group with three to four other people. Ideally, you play with people who have compatible schedules and who are already friends or who you get along with well. In my opinion, one of the first questions you should ask is when you're recruiting someone for your D&D group is not only do you want to play D&D, but are you available Friday nights? <laughs> uh, and and make this scheduling almost one of your first levels of filtering and deciding whether to, to make it work. Um, and if you're forming a new group with people that you haven't met yet, that you are new friends, um, but you maybe haven't played D&D with each other before or ever played D&D at all before, I really recommend planning a short campaign of three to six game sessions. Use one of the D&D starter sets or essential kits like Lost Minds of Phandelver or Dragon of Stormrack Isle and plan to finish one of those starter adventures completely. And then once you've gotten used to that social dynamic with one another, then dive in to the full campaign. In a lot of respects, getting a new D&D group together is kind of like dating, you kind of have to get an idea of people's personalities and how they match and like try a few things together before you find out, okay, whether or not this is going to work long term. And I think that it's actually healthy for us to think of forming a game group like that. If everybody goes in with the intention of like, this may not be the right group for me, this may not work out, uh, there is a possibility that this could be a great experience, like dating. But there's also a possibility that you just don't gel and maybe you need to find a different group to play yeah. with. Yeah, and it's kind of that whole idea of like, you don't go into your first date with someone immediately starting to think about what marriage, kids, and buying a house together and your retirement's going to look like. I mean, if you do, then <sighs> don't. Don't. Um, and so for the same reason, if you're putting together a new group of people, maybe don't necessarily start thinking about what's going to happen at the level 20 por portion of the campaign after you've been playing together for three years. It, it's it's a bit of that same mentality of, of thinking about things in, in, in terms of, we just met each other and we're still figuring out what our social dynamic is. Of course, if you're playing with friends that you've known for some time, uh, maybe friends that you've been playing other online games with, maybe friends that you've played other games like Magic the Gathering or Warhammer or other tabletop games or board games with, maybe you already have a sense of the social dynamic for, for each other, but it can sometimes be surprising. I have a bunch of friends that I love playing board games with, but that I do not enjoy playing D&D &D with. 
Uh, and so, so, and so sometimes it can be surprising how even a social dynamic shifts when what the activity that you're doing is shifts. Yeah. There's a pretty interesting complication that can occur here, and that is whether there are pre-existing dynamics that make you need to include more than one person, whether they're, you invite one person and they want to bring their significant other along, or they say, hey, my brother really wants to play. I Or all your roommates have to be part of the group. Yeah. I, one of my first tables, actually, um, it was uh, Jill jill's husband and jill's brother that all came to the table and although the dynamic worked for one campaign uh there started to become issues with scheduling or interpersonal issues uh, and things like that and we had to end up deciding whether we could separate these people and and that was a conversation that had to end up occurring it can be really challenging um i've played D with many people who are couples who were package deals and i got along really really well with one person in in the package deal whether whether they were in like a, a relationship or siblings or just friends and it was like you had to invite the person that you liked and then accept the person that you maybe didn't jive with very well in order to play D and D with the person who you really enjoy playing D and D with. And, and, uh, and I will say that like not jiving with them, I'm friends with, with all of the people I've played D and D with, but sometimes at the table, it's not the dynamic I'm looking for in my games. Yeah. Uh, now, the question that a lot of people are asking out there, we hear all the time about success stories of people who play with five, six, seven or more nine. players nine well i've heard yeah and heard. and if you are one of those success stories great but our big advice here the question can you play with more than four players in our professional opinion uh what, <laughs> whatever that's worth yeah once you have a small campaign under your belt and the dynamic of the table is set you can decide for yourself if it makes sense for you to add a fifth or sixth player we personally feel that once you pass six players, things become very challenging for any DM. This, for all of the above mentioned reasons. I consider myself a very experienced DM, and I do not run long-term campaigns for more than four players. I'm willing to run one-shots for however many groups, especially if it's a low-stakes thing, sure. Um, but I, I vastly prefer, I feel I'm at my best with a group of three or four players. And I do think determining where you're at your best is important. If you try a few games with five to six players and realize it isn't working for you, it's okay to have that conversation with your table. Perhaps someone else wants to DM a second group. This is actually how I got started DMing. I was playing at Monty's table. We had a pretty big group and we had other friends that wanted to play and we just never had room for them and didn't want to play for more than the six player group that we had. So I started DMing my own group. Perhaps if you have a large group of six or more players, you might split the group in half and invite one or two more people and have the and have two separate groups going at the same time. The key is finding what's going to work for you and what you can handle. We highly recommend that you only consider going to a gaming group of seven or more players if you really have some experience as a DM and a long-standing group of players who know each other and you have an established social dynamic. That's why Critical Role works, because Matt Mercer and all of the other players there are long-term friends who've known each other for a while. They have a very strong existing social dynamic and they're experienced with D&D &D as, as a whole. It works for them because of the social dynamic that they have crafted over years of playing together and being friends and business partners. And so that is the kind of the... And of course, they're also all professionals. And so that magic sauce is what makes that whole thing work. Although I will even say, admittedly, I do find it still as a viewer of Critical Role, it can be a little bit overwhelming with not like nine people at, at the table. And, and even for myself in, in my own taste, when I watch actual play shows, I generally prefer things like the adventure zone where there's three people in a DM. And I think that. To finish this off, our best advice is just to say, start small and then figure out what works for you from there. But if you're already at a big table, 
try one or two sessions with a smaller group. Uh, obviously, it's going to be hard to say, hey, you guys don't come tonight. But if a few people can't make it, run a one shot yeah. and see how it feels if you have less people. You might be surprised at how much less stress you have as a DM with a smaller group. Sometimes there is a tendency to have a group of six, seven, eight players and operate under the assumption that two or three people aren't going to make it. And then you'll effectively have a group of four people. In my experience, that is not an ideal situation. I find that if you have a table where routinely several players are not making it to the game, it really makes the continuity from session to session very difficult and challenging to establish. There's some ways that campaign structure can make this work better, but I definitely found that when I was routinely having a group where two or three people were not making it, and then we were rolling with four when I was planning for six, and sometimes I wouldn't know until the day before whether I was going to have three players, four players, or seven players, I found that very frustrating over the long term for myself, which is why I try to stick now to long term campaigns with a small number of players who can routinely make it. So if you have experienced the problems of large groups or the joys of small groups, or you have differing opinions from what we've stated in this video, please let us know about all of that in the comments below. The videos that we create on our channel are made possible thanks to the incredible generosity of our Patreon supporters. If you enjoy the work that we do here on YouTube, please consider becoming a patron, joining our patron-only Discord server. The links are right down below. And if you want to see how awesome a small group can be, check out our actual play in the Worlds of Drakenheim, which airs Tuesday evenings right here on YouTube. You can check out all the previous episodes right up over here. And we got plenty more great DMing advice right up over here. Please subscribe to our channel, like this video, and ring that bell so that you never miss an episode. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time in, in the, the dungeon. dungeon.